Hello, welcome again. Thank you for joining us for today's Sight and Sound Bites webinar uh, on hearing loss and cognitive decline. My name is Carrie Fogel, and I'm the Senior Director of Development for Foundation Relations at the Eye and Ear Foundation. And if you've attended these before, you know that we um, hold these webinars every month in different topics of hearing loss, uh, sinus allergy, uh, conditions of the voice, and also in, in vision loss. Um, and vision diseases. So today's topic is hearing loss and cognitive decline. Our speaker is Dr. Katherine Palmer. Um, a quick reminder before I introduce Dr. Palmer that we invite you to please submit questions at any point through the presentation uh, in the Q&A box. Following the presentation, I'll be moderating the question and answer part of the program with Dr. Palmer. Um, following the presentation, there will be a video of today's webinar posted on the IENIR Foundation website that you can refer to at any time. Um, and if you have any direct questions for any member of the IENIR Foundation team or Dr. Palmer, you um, can find us at our website, www.ienir.org, or um, you can email Craig Smith, which is attached to your invitation today. Um, so I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Katherine Palmer. She is a professor in the School of Medicine's Department of Otolaryngology and the director of the audiology and director of audiology service for UPMC Health System. Uh, she is also the new chair of the Communication Science and Disorders Department at the University of Pittsburgh School of Health and Rehab Sciences. Congratulations to Dr. Palmer, that is a new title. Um, and she has been the director of Pitt's Doctor of Audiology program since 2007. Uh, Dr. Palmer's research focuses broadly on the relationship between hearing, cognitive health, and health outcomes, and matching technology to meet individual needs. Her current work is focused on developing delivery models that support identification of hearing loss and provision of hearing assistance in healthcare settings where individuals can't fully participate in decision making if their communication is compromised by hearing loss. Uh, additionally, she received the American Academy of Audiology Presidential Award in 2022 and received the honors of the Academy in 2023. Um, she currently chairs the AAA Over-the-Counter Hearing Aid Task Force and serves as Editor-in-Chief of the Seminars in Hearing and as a consultant of, to the National Board of Medical Examiners related to their disability services. Uh, finally, Dr. Palmer was an integral part of the team that has implemented free hearing clinics in Southwestern Pennsylvania to serve individuals who do not have access to hearing care. This program has expanded to include three free hearing clinics in the community and has been heavily involved in the Mission of Mercy event every year here in Pittsburgh. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Catherine Palmer to start our discussion today. Thank you. Harry, thanks so much for that kind um, introduction and, and getting to do all those things is very much related to being at the University of Pittsburgh and UPMC and really importantly working with the Eye and Ear Foundation. So I'm, I'm really so lucky in what I do. Um, so we're going to talk about hearing loss and cognitive decline today. Um, and I, this is a topic that I think really frightens or, or for some people terrifies them. Um, and so I think part of the goal well, to be not being frightened or terrified. Um, so the first part of the talk, I am gonna talk about data um, and hopefully to make it relatable to, to move over time in terms of what we know um, at this point. And then I'm gonna move into um, kind of what we can do and then some of the programs we're involved in, what, what we are doing. So hopefully that will be um, useful. But we'll definitely leave time for questions because I think on a topic like this, um, there are often questions. So I'm gonna take you back to 1989, which is the first publication that really talks about the relationship of dementia and hearing loss. So sometimes you'll, you, people will use the word cognitive decline. Sometimes they're specifically using um, the word dementia, but think of it generally as um, overarching cognitive decline. So uh, Ullman and colleagues in 1989 uh, published a study. And basically what they found was that the prevalence of hearing loss was higher in people with dementia. So in a, in a group of people with dementia, they were measuring whether they um, had hearing loss um, and they found they had more hearing loss than a group without dementia. And then the other thing they noted in this study was hearing loss was correlated with severity of cognitive dysfunction 
measured by what you may um, have heard the MMSC. That's what, that's often what it's called. It's the mini mental state examination. Um, and so these two findings were reported. It's it's important to know that this is what we think of as an observational study. So when you think of people talk about randomized controlled studies, what happens in a study like that is you, you bring people into the study and you put them into different groups um, to look at them perhaps over time or with different treatments you might do. An observational study means these people already existed and you're kind of taking advantage of that, in a, not in a bad way, but in a good way to do some measurements and try to get a sense of um, a topic that you're interested in. So a study like this doesn't necessarily give you a lot of information to act on, but it gives you information to get other researchers perhaps interested in the area so they can do more work and try, try to know more um, about this. And so part of this got some people at least thinking about, um, are there similar processes in dementia and hearing loss? So when we think of things you know, at the, at the brain level, maybe are the things that are causing dementia, could they be interrupting hearing or, or the other way around? So really kind of looking at it at that um, system level is something in common uh, with these two things. But interestingly, um, it really wasn't for another 10 years that anything in this area was going on at all, which is really a, a fairly long um, time when you think about what was reported in this study. And really um, around 1998, so 10 years later, our, our group, and it's not that no one else was thinking about this, but I'm gonna kind of highlight what our group, group was thinking about. And this started with John Durant, who was the director of audiology uh, before I was, and a, and a great colleague here at the University of Pittsburgh. And one thing he was interested in is um, really the clinical side of this, like what, what can we do? And there was um, really a common myth that people with cognitive decline or dementia couldn't complete a hearing test. So even if they had hearing loss, in a sense, the thought was, well, we can't do very much because we can't uh, test their hearing. So John, along with the colleagues at the Eye and Ear Institute, did, did a study and reported it just with people with different levels of dementia that could still come into the clinic um, and whether they could have um, reliable hearing tests. And, and the answer was definitely they could. And when you think about it, if you've had a hearing test, it's a fairly simple activity, the basic hearing test. So you're, you're hearing tones, you're indicating whether you heard them or not. And people can indicate this in all different ways. They can say yes, they can raise their hand. So as long as we're flexible about how they might tell us about what they're hearing, we definitely could get the hearing status for these individuals. So that was important to know if we wanna do anything in terms of, of treatment. And then um, my group in, in 98, um, wanted to look on kind of what what could we do in in a sense of helping individuals. We were not interested more in the basic science of exactly what's happening. Not that that's not interesting. And of course we care about that, but, but we were really applying more like, okay, but what can we do right now for these families? Um, so this was actually a study more focused on caregiver burden um, than really the, the people with dementia them, themselves. And so, well, and this was uh, related to another group's work that Michelle Bourgeois headed up of trying to support the caregivers of loved ones with um, dementia who are trying to keep them home and, and keep their you know, lives functioning and what, how, how can you help those individuals? So we tacked on to that study saying, well, one way might be to help the person with dementia who has hearing loss hear better. And, and why might that help? Well, when you look at some of the symptoms of dementia, they really very much overlap with hearing loss. So things like um, needing things repeated, that could be because you don't remember them, but it also could be because you didn't hear them correctly or um, ending up not following instructions or doing something when you were asked that could be you know, that you're not um, understanding, it could be cognitive, but it also could be that you didn't hear it correctly. So there's a fair amount of overlap so then it's interesting if you can um, fit hearing aids with a person with dementia, well-fit hearing aids that they can tolerate and use, um, could you decrease some of those symptoms? So that doesn't mean you're curing dementia, certainly no one's claiming that, but could you decrease those symptoms? And if you did, would that help the caregiver uh, perhaps be less frustrated, 
um, and manage what they need to do. So that's what we did. We went to people's homes, actually, tested hearing, fit hearing aids. Um, and then we were doing counts from the caregiver's point of view of things that were um, difficult for them. So they identified those ahead of time. They counted them um, when the person was not using hearing aids. And then they would continue counting um, after the person was using hearing aids. And what we found was a real decrease in, in some of that burdensome activity. And so just to give you a sense, things like with the hearing aids, now the person could just focus more like on a TV show. And for the caregiver, that could be huge. That could give them, you know, 30 minutes or 45 minutes to be preparing dinner while the person was engaged with a show. I remember one family that always sticks out in my mind. Um, with the hearing aids, the loved one could now identify different sounds that meant it was a different time of day. So for instance, the, the mailman always came at like noon and he could hear that the mailman was there once he was using hearing aids. And that kind of centered him on, okay, that's what time of day it is now. So interesting how hearing could contribute to that. Um, but again, the major finding here is we could reduce caregiver burden if that individual was hearing um, better. So helpful information perhaps. But now more time goes by, really. We're going another decade to 2009. You're in, and I don't mean there's nothing, but there's very little um, in the literature. And now we're at around 2011. So right around that time. So about um, 20 years after the Allman Report, and Frank Lynn, who's at Johns Hopkins, and his colleagues um, reported one of the first really big studies um, that looked at hearing loss and incident dementia. And when I say study, a, a big part of what this group does is looks at big databases of information. Um, and it could be like health insurance data where you can kind of track what have, what have people have accessed, what they're doing. Sometimes it's a big database of people that are followed over the years. You might be in one of those studies where you go in every year or so and they do different things. And some of those studies include hearing tests. So they started to um, publish uh, information. And, and the word we would use is they were seeing an association uh, between cognitive decline and hearing loss. So that's different from one causing the other, but an association um, that they seem to be to be linked. And therefore, um, maybe you would want to do something. And, and we think about doing something about the hearing loss, right? Because that's something we tangible that we can do. And then I wrote here after that time until now, there's been a 340% increase in publications. That's not my number. I want to give full credit to Nick Reed, who's part of the group at Hopkins. Um, I think he sat down and counted all these uh, and then gave us this information. So the point being just a, a real um, increase in this information. And I'm sure you've seen there's been an increase. This um, information's in the popular press all the time. There are New York Times articles, um, the, you know, all different um, publications, news programs. Um, are talking about this information. And it's often what motivates a patient to come and see us in the clinic, which is which is fine. It's good to have that information out there. So I want to mention in 2016, our group, um, again, headed up by Lindsay Jorgensen, who was a PhD student at the time, and this was her dissertation. She got thinking back to that original study that Ullman did um, about people having, people with hearing loss showing more severe dementia when you measured it with that MMSE, the mini mental um, status exam. And so what, what Lindsay was thinking about is the fact that that exam is an oral exam. So the, the healthcare provider or physician or whoever it is, is asking questions and the person has to hear them and answer them. So you probably see where I'm going with this. If you have really moderately severe or severe hearing loss and you're not using amplification, which was which was the case in this study, then you're not hearing these questions well. And so the report or the, the result, the score that you get is really hard to tease out what was the dementia and what was the hearing loss. So not to imply that these people didn't have cognitive decline, but you really wonder um, if it's looking more severe because they also couldn't completely hear the questions uh, they were being asked. And Lindsay did a really neat study um, where we can actually um, mimic hearing loss. So we can create it as if a person has hearing loss um, to um, simulate it. And she took very um, cognitively normal uh, college students and then simulated these different levels of hearing loss and, and then gave them the MMSE in a standard way, like it would be given in the clinic. 
And what was interesting is um, these very cognitively normal uh, college students looked like they had dementia if they even had mild to moderate hearing loss. So they would get you know a little bit lower score. And then when we mimicked more moderately severe loss, um, they really looked severely um, cognitively impaired. So, um, and since this time, different groups have worked now um, to modify these scales so they can be done differently um, and, and try to make up for that. Although, you know, one way to handle this is to put amplification on people uh, before they take this kind of test or even with and without to, to try to tease that out a little bit. Um, so certainly hearing matters uh, in these cases. And then another study right around this time um, came out that was um, got a fair amount of attention. And so just to interpret this graph, what, what you're looking at is on the y-axis up and down, that's a memory score, okay? So a high is good, a high score is good. And then what you're seeing across the x-axis or the horizontal is you're looking at um, like time in a sense. Um, and, and what you have here is at zero is you've moved everybody to zero the, the, at the time point where they got hearing aids. So this, this they're looking at a group that didn't have hearing aids, got hearing aids, and, it, and they kept doing this measure over time. Um, so they didn't all get hearing aids at the same time, but they put them all together on the graph. So you, it, you, know, you can interpret this. So what you're seeing with the orangey red line that's going down the graph from your left to right is the, the um, decrease in, in cognitive ability. So there's a trajectory that's, that's going down. And what you see with the blue line is that trajectory changed. It didn't stop decreasing. So these people had cognitive decline, but if they had stayed at the same rate, it would have looked like what the second orange piece of the line looks like. Um, so there seemed to be some you know, modifying of what was happening here and, and retaining any cognition is good, right? Just in terms of being able to live at home and um, be able to function. So those were interesting results that came out um, that were compelling and kind of motivating that we would want to treat hearing loss. And then we jump to 2020, and you may be familiar with this study, the Lancet Commission, um, which is a, a really well-respected uh, group that comes out um, with large, um, summaries of, of data that they pull together and they make statements. And the statement here was that untreated hearing loss in midlife, which is interesting, so not just focusing on older adults, but, but untreated hearing loss at the point of midlife is the largest modifiable risk factor for dementia. So a modifiable risk factor means if we, if we do something about it, we can change the outcome. We can impact the outcome. We, we aren't, again, claiming that you can just cure dementia, but that the, the pathway would be altered in a positive way. So the um, report, if you looked at it, has really pretty graphics like this. Um, and you can see in the blue circle where it says 8% and it, it says hearing loss, and that's in midlife. So there are 12 risk factors they ended up coming up with um, that one would have in midlife that might um, predict and impact whether you're going to see dementia later. Um, and so 40% of dementia they found overall could be modifiable if you modified all these different things or didn't, you know, in some cases didn't have these different things. And so for hearing loss, again, um, they ended up with a statement that it's the single largest modifiable risk factor. Um, and that's, that's important news. And again, drove a lot of people into the clinic. And I guess whatever the reason, it's good because hearing well is just good generally for your overall well-being. Um, but again, my point today is I want us to just be realistic about what data we really have. So when you interpret the Lancet data, it's not talking about one individual. So it's not saying that we can reduce your um, you know, risk 8%. It's really looking at world population when, when we look at those kinds of data. Um, and so if we could remove hearing loss at the population level, so we just didn't have it, um, then you could decrease um, dementia by 8%. 8 so it would 8% of dementia would be gone. So I only say that not to minimize that we um, have enough data to say, yeah, we should be treating hearing loss, it matters. Um, but again, not to kind of over overstate what some of the data have, have told us. So then just at the end of last year, um, we saw the first results of the ACHIEVE trial. 
So this again is coming out of Franklin's group at Johns Hopkins. This is the first randomized control trial um, that has been done really looking at um, cognitive decline, hearing loss, and, and more specifically, treatment with hearing aids. And when I say treatment with hearing aids, really what we mean is well-fit hearing aids. So bringing um, sound back just the way it needs to be for the person and they can use the hearing aids well. So that's exciting then to have a randomized controlled trial because we can say a lot more when we know everything was controlled, people were put in randomly. It wasn't like all the people that were gonna have cognitive decline ended up in one group, you know, so, so a well-controlled trial. This trial is continuing and more data will continue to come out, you know, often, I think. Um, but the the first data that came out um, when they interpreted this is in older adults with increased risk for cognitive decline, there was a reduction in that cognitive decline, suggesting hearing intervention might reduce cognitive change over three years. And that's what it's a th so far we've been three years into this study. So, so that is important because I think in the news, it just kind of came out that hearing aids are gonna reduce cognitive decline. Um, but, but actually in this study so far, what they know is if individuals had an increased risk for cognitive decline, it made a difference. In people that didn't have the increased risk, it's not that it doesn't make a difference, but it's too early to see yet because with this decreased risk for cognitive decline, they're not gonna decline as quickly anyway. So you're not you're not seeing change yet. So we have to wait a little bit longer. Um, but we know this matters definitely for this group with increased risk. Um, and so we'll we'll need some more time. And I'm sure these data will keep um, being reported. So I, I put two statements up here only because I've heard people say them, and um, and people shouldn't be saying these. So if you hear this, you should reject it. Um, and one would be if you have hearing loss uh, and you do not use hearing aids, you will experience dementia. That is not a true statement. Uh, or at least let me put it this way. We don't have evidence to say that at this time. Maybe someday we will. Um, but we certainly don't now. So that um, that kind of a bold statement would not be accurate. Um, and the other one is if you use hearing aids, you will not develop dementia. No one has any evidence to make a statement like that either. Now, are there all sorts of reasons uh, things will go better if you have treat your hearing and you're hearing well? A absolutely. Um, and we're gonna talk about some of those. So when we think about it, um, it would be interesting to think about what's contributing to cognitive decline and poor health outcomes with untreated hearing loss. And this, there's still lots of room for research in this area because there's still that notion way from the beginning is is something happening in tandem? You know, as we age, is there more of a brain structure issue where both of these issues are being impacted, both cognition and hearing? So that's an interesting area. Um, there's people doing animal work um, in that area that helps us, you know, kind of tease these things out. So that's an important area. People are looking at that. But in the meantime, someone like me, who thinks a lot more um, clinically about, okay, given what we know now, what can we do now? Because when I see patients every week, it's not gonna help them for me to say, you know, probably in five or 10 years, we'll have more research, research and we'll know more because they need me to do something right now and give them advice right now. So that's what we try um, really hard to do um, in, in the, our department of otolaryngology is give really evidence-based advice for what we know right now. And then we're forever updating that um, when new information comes out. So what we do know is untreated hearing loss is definitely related to depression, social isolation, reduced activity, and reduced access to healthcare. And all of those um, can, can come together and have an impact on healthy aging in general and on cognition. The other thing we know that's at the bottom of your screen is we have limited cognitive resources. We, we have a finite amount. And so when we think of those cognitive resources, if we don't hear well, we have to allocate more cognitive resources just to figure out what was said. Because what we're doing, if we hear some of the message, but not all of it, is we're filling in the blanks. And as, as adults, we have... Um, lots of language exposure, we use context, and we can do that, but it takes energy, it takes effort. 
and the energy and effort we're using for that, we don't have leftover for the other things we need to do. Um, and as we get older, um, you know, that that's, we don't want our cognitive resources being used up on just hearing um, when we can do something about hearing. So we wanna make hearing much less effortful so then we can use our cognitive re resources to make decisions, take in information, navigate space, all the things we need to do um, to, to function well. But for a minute, I'm gonna focus on um, those other areas. So what we do know is with untreated hearing loss, so you've had hearing loss, but no, no treatment, you are more vulnerable to depression um, and social isolation. There's very clear data that social isolation is very bad for people. Um, it impacts their overall health. You have an increased risk of not following recommendations accurately. Um, and then having medical adverse events. And those are the number one reason to be hospitalized. And people with untreated hearing loss have a, a higher um, readmission to the hospital and a higher incidence of delirium, which means when you're in the hospital becoming very confused, which is, which is really very frightening. We also have data at this point that using appropriately fit amplification decreases all of these issues. So that alone is what would drive one to, to do something about their hearing. Um, and cognition is wrapped all into this, but these we really have pretty compelling, we have compelling data um, that that makes a difference for people. Okay, so we've teamed up, um, UPMC Audiology and the Eye and Ear Foundation and the University of Pittsburgh um, to try to make a difference in a, in a lot of these um, different areas. And I thought it might be interesting to talk a little bit about some of those um, programs. And you, you may have questions about some of these programs. Um, and you also, some of the people on this call very well, maybe some of the people that help support these programs. And if that's the case, um, please know that we are very grateful that you help us uh, make a difference. So one thing to think about in terms of healthcare as we're just talking about this um, topic is, when we think about older Americans, um, how are they getting their health care, and what are the barriers um, to health care? And there are a number of articles that that kind of talk about this. Um, and and what becomes evident is having hearing loss is a barrier to accessing health care. So people, and I should always say untreated hearing loss. So people with untreated hearing loss, um, are a little bit less likely to come into the doctor because it's really frustrating um, and they don't have a good experience um, if they're not hearing well and they feel like they don't get all the information and maybe people don't take the time um, they need to take. So right there, that's an increased barrier. And for an aging adult, there may be other barriers in terms of mobility and having needing someone maybe to take time and, and take you. But hearing loss alone, um, is a barrier just for accessing care and being satisfied or happy with that care. So just a couple of programs, like I said, I wanna highlight. Um, one program we do uh, across the entire UPMC system is we provide simple amplifiers for inpatients. So patients that come into the hospital who aren't hearing well, and that could be just that they have untreated hearing loss that they've never treated. It could be that they were hearing aids but didn't bring them to the hospital because they're afraid they'll be lost, which is, a common um, fear and not completely misplaced. Um, or there may be people who didn't even realize they had hearing loss, but now they're in the hospital and people are communicating terminology that's not familiar and they're having a harder time or people wearing masks um, and they're having a harder time. So across the system, if someone's identified as hearing loss, having hearing loss, that can be by themselves, their family, the nurse, the doctor, the PT, the OT, the SLP, anybody who works with them, the person who comes and cleans up the room could identify them. Um, and we will bring them an amplifier and we work with the nursing stations to make sure that they have amplifiers. And so these are just some numbers starting back in 2011 when we started keeping the data. Um, you see a surge in these uh, use of amplifiers. And this is just our, our main Presbyterian um, Montefiore Hospital. We, we do do this across the system. But in 2020, there's a surge and you probably all have guessed uh, that's because suddenly literally everybody had masks on because we were in the midst of COVID and a lot of people realized they really needed more help hearing um, and the amplifiers helped. Um, but we surpassed that number this year. So we're excited about that too. And that happens kind of when more and more healthcare providers um, know about this program. So they use a simple amplifier um, and they take it home with them. So um, anything that's in an in inpatient room can't be reused. So we encourage people to take the amplifiers home. They can use them in rehab or for um, you know, just 
while they're recovering at home. Another project that uh, the Ioneer Foundation has been intimately related to is Hear Care, um, which is Hearing for Communication and Resident Engagement. This is another example. So those amplifiers in the inpatient side is an example of us trying to make healthcare more accessible. Um, and here we're in assisted living, um, trying to make those, uh, those kind of facilities more accessible as well. We actually have audiology and in independent senior and um, skilled nursing um, across UPMC in Southwestern Pennsylvania. This was a project specific to assisted living where the audiologist goes once a month and certainly can help people. But then we have what's called a communication facilitator who goes twice a week, who really just helps everybody in the building communicate better, whether that's you know helping them upkeep their hearing aids or maybe they don't use hearing aids and we help with um, good communication strategies or other kinds of simple low cost amplifiers, TV amplifiers, so that helps your neighbor not have to hear your TV if you need it to be really loud or, or when you're in group settings, uh, making sure you can play bingo and hear what's being called. So this has uh, been a big project. We started with funding from the Hearst Foundation um, and then we're funded by uh, the Cori, which is national funding to look at these um, kinds of activities. Uh, so we've we've really enjoyed being part of that project. So this is just a picture. We have the audiologist. You're seeing Amanda Cassidy on your screen who heads up the program. And then um, one of the communication facilitators, this happens to be a picture of Kate Dimowski, who's now an audiology student at Pitt, which is nice as well that she's gone into the field. We have a, a brand new program called Thrive, um, and Ioneer Foundation helped us uh, work with the Eaton Hall Foundation. And this is another one, again, trying to make the care accessible to people and have them be comfortable and trust that, that we can help. And this is working with community health workers. So community health workers are people who are out in communities um, who are trusted. They're known by their community who can give information, and in this case, about vision and hearing. Um, and where there are resources so people can get um, the help they might need to, again, help them stay independent and living uh, in their communities. So just starting this program um, and, and really excited to keep moving forward. Um, then we've been moving into teleaudiology. Our first teleaudiology, and I give um, Lori Zatelli, who's part of our group, full credit for this, was really during COVID where we suddenly really needed to try to support patients at a distance if they had hearing aid problems or any of that kind of thing. We, we did some online hearing testing during that time um, to triage people to figure out if they really needed to come into the clinic. Um, and, and we've kept with offering um, some of those services, but now we're really expanding this um, for people in rural communities so we can um, help them with getting um, hearing testing, but also with, with hearing, hearing aid fitting um, when they literally can't get to one of our clinics. So again, a, a little bit, um, it's not completely new because we've been doing it, but we're, we're definitely uh, formalizing some of our teleaudiology, especially again, to work um, with our, our rural friends um, and then just some of our, our patients who become housebound and really, really can't get to us. So using technology to everybody's advantage. And then we're just teaming up, uh, Ioneer Foundation with Brothers Brother um, and hoping to team, team up with a whole bunch of other people to create a hearing and communication um, mobile unit. Um, and we're excited about this. Again, one more way to get to people, especially if they're not getting to us for care, but we'll also use this for research. Um, one, one thing we know in the different studies that um, are reported, minorities are woefully left out of these studies. So we don't have information that could be really important um, to working with different different groups of people. Um, so this is another way to get to people that maybe wouldn't be finding their way um, either to our clinics or, or to our labs. And then this, these are data and, and just putting up when I'm on the topic of um, trying to make sure we can um, support different minority populations and tailor care that makes sense for them and, and have them be comfortable with with pursuing that, that care. Um, this is uh, on your up and down axis, again, your Y axis, it's the probability for hearing aid use. So the probability that you'll be using hearing aids. And then what you have are, you have the um, population who would identify as white is a blue dot. The population who identifies as black is a red dot and Hispanic population would be a green dot. And where it says non-dual partial QMB, what, what that's saying is 
These are older adults with Medicare. So they, they just have Medicare, they're Medicare beneficiaries. So they've turned 65 um, and, and they have access to Medicare. And in terms of being likely to have a hearing aid, you see your individuals who identify as white have a much higher probability um, with our, our black uh, individuals with the lowest probability. And so many of you are probably aware that hearing aids are not covered by Medicare. Um, our professional associations put a bill in every year trying to change that, um, but that has not changed thus far. And it would take an act of Congress to change that because when Medicare was created, um, things like hearing aids, glasses, um, a lot of dental kinds of things were statutorily excluded from Medicare. So it would take an act of Congress to, to include them in Medicare. So when you start looking at some of these, they're, they're true health disparities in hearing aid access because they, are, they typically are an out-of-pocket um, expense or there's just a little bit of coverage for them. So it doesn't only um, break down in, in terms of race, but it breaks down in terms of socioeconomic status. And you see that when you go to the part that says full dual, what that's telling us is these are people that not only are on Medicare, but they're on Medicaid. So they're individuals who, if they have if they had resources, those have been spent down or they may not have had resources. And so they're Medicare age, but they also have Medicaid, which means financially they need, need assistance. Um, and then you see um, the the spread here that it makes a, a big difference as well. Um, you know, if you don't if you don't have resources um, separate from ethnicity or race. So just to point out um, that we have people really struggling, even if they would be willing to come in and get help, they can't. You know, financially they can't. So that um, got us going. And this is a picture of Rachel Fryett, who's a pit grad, and she had this idea that we all then got behind and it's taken off since. Uh, we call this Here Up. Um, the Iron Urine Foundation is, is a huge part of this um, because it's donations that run these programs. Um, but we run three free clinics. I think Carrie mentioned those at the beginning where we fit hearing aids um, for people. We do this once a month at the free, Birmingham Free Clinic, Catholic Charities and the Squirrel Hill Health Center. And for the last two years, we've also been part of Mission of Mercy. Um, which is exciting. So we fit 254 people with hearing aids over two days um, this past fall, and it's a lot of Pitt alumni come back and Pitt students. So it's and, and the Ioneer Foundation is a huge part of of one making that happen financially, but they all stay on the floor and help us as well, which is great. And a new program for us is Clear Dashboard. Um, back to our Hearst Foundation friends, which has been exciting for them to help us again. You may know that there are now over-the-counter hearing aids. The goal of over-the-counter hearing aids is accessibility. It's to try to make uh, some less expensive devices available to people with mild to moderate hearing loss who could do self-care, that they might be able to help themselves before they need more customized care that you get from an audiologist. Um, but what we've found so far, these became legal in October. October, um, October, sorry, 2022. And what we found is people are actually just thoroughly confused. Um, and so we have a lot of people who've purchased these devices over the counter, end up coming into the clinic. We're happy to see them. We're happy to help them with their devices or if they need something different, you know, whatever they need. But Clear Dashboard is, is work we're doing headed up um, by Jamie Katz here at the university. Um, where we're creating a, a, a very friendly interface, all done um, with stakeholder input from real live consumers who would be going on a website like this to figure out if you were trying to sort through the hundreds of devices, you know, what, sh what questions should we ask you to help you um, hone in on, on a, just a smaller set of devices. And then um, other colleagues here, um, faculty at the University of Pittsburgh are putting together laboratory tests, really quite sophisticated tests, so we can measure these devices on real people um, and be able to give some scores. It'll be called the clear score. So if you went and were trying to find a device for you, you could answer some questions, have a small set of devices, and then you could compare them based on their features, but also on scores of how people um, did using these. So we're excited about this. Again, this is a new project that'll be going over, um, hopefully forever, honestly. I, we'll keep developing this. Um, and then I mentioned Thrive before, and I just put it back here, because again, it, it also it relates to our um, wanting to get out to people who, who may not have the resources to get hair, 
care and make sure they know about our free programs and things like that. So urgency to action, I'll just finish up. Um, typically, there's not urgency to action to go get a baseline hearing test, unlike what we might think about in terms of vision care or dental care. Um, way fewer adults get their hearing tested. Um, but your PCP should definitely be recommending that. And they don't have to recommend it. You can do it without their recommendation. Um, but come in and get a baseline. Um, and the best way to do that would be if we had a way to screen hearing. Um, and we don't. So this is showing you age across the bottom from newborn babies up to 80 plus year olds and the percent of hearing loss. So hearing loss prevalence is in green. So very, very few children have hearing loss. That's great. And as we age, many, many more people have hearing loss. And then the blue lines are how many people get their hearing screened. So we have universal newborn screening. So every baby that's born in a hospital in the States has a hearing screening, which is so critical because we can pick up hearing loss immediately and, and help them, help the families. But with you look at older adults, they have lots of hearing loss, but almost no screening. So another project that we've worked on is called Lydia, Listening Identification and Immediate Amplification. And again, the Foundation and Pitt Innovation Institute have been a big part of Lydia. Um, and what Lydia is, is the first really inexpensive hearing screener that's accurate and can be done in real world conditions. Like when the person rolls in the cart, then they take your blood pressure and your temperature. They can do this for a hearing screening. You count how many beeps you hear. Um, and then if you don't hear as many as you should, you leave the headset on and Lydia becomes an amplifier and helps you hear during your healthcare uh, appointment. So um, we're excited about Lydia. Um, the first run are coming off the line um, this Friday, actually. So um, hot off the press, that news for, for all of you. So a little guidance, have, get a hearing test. Um, if you have hearing loss, get hearing aids um, sooner rather than later, if you can. Um, if you can't, you can, and you have a smartphone, you can make your smartphone function as a hearing aid. Um, it, it's all built into the iPhone. Um, it's true with an Android as well. Uh, we can help you with that in the clinic as well. If you're not, if you're someone who doesn't want to get hearing aids, um, if you do have hearing aids, wear them all your waking hours. We know you'll have the best result. Part-time hearing aid users don't do well because their brain is going between their hearing loss and amplification. Um, hearing aids don't cure hearing loss and they don't magically remove noise. So you need you do need to be realistic. Um, your brain is what lets you hear in noise. So again, that full-time use matters more than anything else and well, well fit hearing aids. Um, if you're a caregiver of someone with cognitive decline um, and the person you care for has hearing aids, that's awesome. Work with the audiologist to keep those hearing aids functioning. And if you have to replace them, you're gonna to wanna to replace them with the exact same thing. So don't make changes. If they're familiar, leave everything familiar. We can keep hearing aids working for many, many years without needing to replace them. And if you're a caregiver with someone with cognitive decline, um, we can, and they don't use hearing, aid, hearing aids, but they have hearing loss, we can work with you to figure out what's gonna be best for you in your situation. Um, and it won't always be a hearing aid. You know, that may be something that it's really too late to introduce that, but that doesn't mean there aren't other things we can do uh, to help, and we're happy to do that. Just to note, things that are free, um, amplified caption landline phones are free from the state. We can sign a form, and you can get one of those phones. They come set it up, teach you how to use it. If you have a smartphone built into um, both Androids and Apples, you can have speech to text. So whatever anyone's saying, you can see it in writing. That can help. Your mobile phone calls can be captioned as well. Like I said, your smartphone actually can be used as an amplifier, like a hearing aid. And we do have the three free um, hearing aid clinics. So let me stop there. Uh, and Carrie, I'd be happy to answer questions if you have any. Thank you, Dr. Palmer. That was a great overview of, um, of the topic and, and all of the resources that uh, you have personally been involved in bringing uh, to people here in our region, um, and we're very grateful. So thank you for the talk and thank you for all that you've done. Uh, we have several questions, so I want to launch into them so we have plenty of time to answer them. Um, you mentioned toward the end of the talk that you recommend people um, get a baseline hearing test. Is there an age where one should consider really getting a baseline is, or 
or does it kind of vary too much person to person? Yeah, so that's a great question. And so there's no strict rule, but more and more, if you look at different guidelines that come out, it's 50, 50 years of age. And that would be if you don't have, um, you know, like other, like you didn't already know you had hearing loss or other problems involved, but just typical, like I should get my hearing um, tested would be 50. Is it more difficult to, like you said, tease out the hearing loss um, from a patient that you're testing for hearing loss if they already have some level of cognitive decline? No. So that's a great question. Um, the, the way we test hearing, um, we really can get those results. So we'll know what their hearing is. Now, teasing out how much the hearing loss is impacting the symptoms of cognitive decline, that's, that's a little bit tougher. Um, but the hearing loss, measuring it is easy and then treating it, we can do. And so then in a sense, the family is going to see what was what, right? If we treat the hearing loss and the person's able to tolerate the hearing aids and use them, then they can see what the difference was. And I never want to imply suddenly the cognitive decline is going to go away. That's not true. But in terms of, um, you know, the how how much it's impacting the person and family may change when we take the hearing part of it off. Thank you. Next, um, we have a question about uh, people who experience hearing loss at a younger age, be it in, during childhood or at a, in their young adulthood, are they more likely and should they be concerned that they're at a higher risk of developing cognitive decline because of their hearing loss? Yeah, so we don't have an answer to that. Um, the good news is if it's a child, typically, they're going to have their hearing treated. So, you know, that doesn't mean no one falls through the cracks, but especially if you think about Pennsylvania, all children in Pennsylvania get hearing aids for free, no matter their status. So um, that's huge in this state. We're the only state that does that consistently. So this is, if you're gonna have hearing loss, it's a good state to be in. Um, so, so, you know, they get good treatment and tend to become good hearing aid users. That is a, a very good question. Um, I don't have a very good answer. I will say if you have a younger person who is not getting treatment, so they don't have treatment for the hearing loss, just like I was kind of saying in the talk, you'll see social isolation, you'll see depression, and those all then link as well. So, you know, it may not be a direct pathway, but the other things that are going to happen are, are going to be unhealthy for that person. And they, they also have lower employment, um, you know, lower income. So that, and that matters as well in terms of overall health and access to care. Does very much matter. Thank you. Um, I've heard that people complain about their hearing aids, either when they first get them or as they're getting used to them, that the hearing aids are bothersome or even that they're painful. What, what kind of strategies would you recommend or what, what would you, an answer would you give someone? Yeah, great question. That? Yeah. So first of all, they should not be painful. So if they're painful, they need to go back because something's not fit, right? So, you know, as we teach students here at the University of Pittsburgh, physical fit is really, really very important. And that's one of the problems of the over-the-counter hearing aids. A lot of those just, they don't fit well or feel good. So physical fit is really important. But when you get hearing aids, the typical hearing loss um, you're going to have if you get hearing aids is what's called a sensory hearing loss. Sensory means there's damage to the sensory system. So it's not like putting glasses on. So for most of us, we have a conductive vision loss, meaning when we put on glasses, we fix that signal and it's going to a healthy sensory system and it can be interpreted and you're good. And that's why most people, when you put on glasses, you know, oh, now I'm seeing well. If you get bifocals, you have a little more you know, adaptation, but pretty good. Hearing, it's not a conductive problem. It's a sensory problem. So there's been damage to the sensory system. So as we fit hearing aids, we're gonna put in the best signal possible. We're gonna put a microphone in your ear. We're gonna make measurements. We're gonna tune that. But that signal is being delivered to a damaged sensory system. So that sensory system is gonna create some distortion and depending on the person, more or less. That's important to understand because hearing aids aren't fixing your hearing. They're not bringing it back to normal. They're certainly gonna create improvement. But by the time you come to get hearing aids, you've probably been walking around, the data suggests, about seven years with this hearing loss. So your brain is totally tuned to hearing through that filter. So when we put the sound back where it should be, your brain is not used to that at all. And your brain's first reaction is, that's just loud and really disturbing. I don't wanna hear all those things. 
That's why when we fit hearing aids and we use all these measurements, we don't really ask you how it sounds because we know you're going to tell us it's too loud and too sharp. And they're like typical words people use. So instead, not that we ignore you, but we say, okay, now what, you know, we work for an hour, you work for three weeks. You have to go wear these all your waking hours other than when you're wet. So don't get them wet. But from morning to night to let your brain fully adjust to the new sound and, and it will. And it's about three weeks for some people, it's a little bit more, but you'll notice change. Like what seemed really loud the first day, three days later, won't seem as loud, like your water running and things like that. Because your brain is literally changing. And we know that from um, other studies that, that look at brain change. So it's changing. But if you're someone who tries to wear hearing aids part-time, never goes well. Because your brain is moving between the hearing loss and the amplification and always in this adjustment period. So you, when you are going to get hearing aids, you need to go all in. You have to become a user, a full-time user. And all those things will adapt. But it will take weeks. It, it, you you know, I always say hearing aids are expensive. You just paid for every one of those sounds. You might as well embrace them, you know, while you're getting used to them. Very good advice for those of us on the call who may one day may need hearing aids. Um, you mentioned during the talk about uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, using telemedicine to kind of address people in a remote way who are concerned about hearing loss. How do you control the background sound yeah. during these telemedicine visits so as to get an accurate measurement of, of yeah. hearing or hearing loss? Yeah, it's just, that's a great question. So we don't, right? So if you want a, a really accurate measure, we need you in the clinic, in a booth, or at least in a really quiet place with like insert earphones. So when you're on your computer, um, there, some of these programs are fairly sophisticated. Um, they're definitely asking you to go to a quiet place. Hopefully you do that. And we kind of work with people to make sure they do that. So really what we get from those results are more like relative measures. So for instance, if we had a person who said, I think I've had sudden hearing loss in one ear, we can do that online because we can see the difference. So we may not exactly have the right levels, but we can see there's a difference between their ears and know that, oh, they should definitely be coming in to see our physicians who are gonna you know, try to do something um, if there's a sudden sudden loss. But this person who's ever asked the question is absolutely right. It, it's not the same as being in a booth, um, but it's better than ever. And they have some nice controls. Um, but if you're sitting in a room blasting music, yeah, it's not, not gonna be good. Uh, there's a question here about regarding uh, COVID-19, the, the virus. Is Have you noticed um, any hearing loss associated with contracting COVID? And if so, have you noticed that it is a temporary condition, more permanent? Is there any proven evidence that they are linked? Yeah, so I'll go right to the evidence because what we notice or don't notice is is not really relevant. relevant. We have to be really careful that you know we see one patient who feels like their hearing loss came along the same time they had COVID, which it may have, but it may have for many different reasons. So we monitor the CDC website and those kind of data. And at this point, there's there's not a link. Um, now, could there be when more and more data come in? Perhaps, but at this time, no. Um, we definitely have patients who firmly believe that's what happened. Um, we don't argue with them. I mean, we're really there to help them with with their hearing, no matter how it happened. But right now, I don't think anyone would tell you in good faith that there's a, a evidence to say there's a link. Would a veteran be able to receive a hearing test and hearing aids through the UPMC audiology clinics that the VA will pay for, or do they need to be seen at the VA facility? Yeah, they need to go to the VA. And I'll just say, we have terrific VA here in Oakland. Those many, many of them are pit grads. We work really closely with them. I know sometimes people think twice about um, accessing care at the VA. I think that's a shame. In terms of hearing care, it's it's stellar hearing care. You're getting fantastic devices. They're the high-end devices. Um, same things we're using in any other clinic, but you do need to go to the VA. Thank you. Someone asked if you could go back over the benefit of using your smartphone as a type of a hearing aid device. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I mean, I, I can tell you that it does that it's too, it's, it would be hard to explain how to do it on the phone or on the, the zoom call. We're happy for people to come in and help them with that. Um, we had a neat project going um, down in new Orleans, actually with unleashing the power of your smartphone, all the different things your smartphone can do. 
Um, so a, a medical student met with people during COVID. So he met with them on a bench in the park <laughs> to stay outdoors to help them do this. Uh, it was a great project. It was a, a the Schweitzer Fellowship um, supported that project. They they support the Here Up Clinic here too. Um, so, but yes, it is. It's an app within your phone. Um, and there are some that are really sophisticated, some that aren't, some that actually do a, a hearing measurement um, with your AirPods in, if you have AirPods, and then um, shape the sound. And what it's doing is it's turning the microphone on your hearing aid on so it can pick up sound, and then it's sending it um, to the AirPods. You can also do it with a, a wire connection to your phone. So it can be a very inexpensive way. And if you already own a cell phone, obviously, that's then it would be inexpensive. Um, to get amplification um, as you're as you're walking around. So Apple's really kind of leaning into that and it's a neat solution. But if if it's hard to figure out, we can certainly help you. Any clinic could help you. So I think we have time for two more questions. I know we have more than two questions here left to answer. Um, so I'll tell the individuals who are asking them to we, that we will answer them offline and get answers to you uh, via email. Um, but I'll, I'll finish with these two questions. Um, do you have thoughts on why eyeglasses are socially acceptable, cosmetically acceptable, or popular, but hearing aids are not? I I don't I, I don't know that I have any more wisdom on that than anyone else. Um, it, it's funny we we did another study actually here about stigma with hearing aids, and what was interesting is when you interview not the hearing aid user but the people who would be interacting. That stigma has decreased significantly from when it was measured. It was kind of measured in the 60s and 70s. But the individual using the hearing aid still often feels like they don't want to do that. And it seems to be because we've associated hearing aids with age and people worry about looking like they're older. Now, what's interesting when we talk to our patients, a lot of them, what makes you look old is not knowing what was said. Um, and so actually using the hearing aids, then you know what's going on around you, which really can be pretty helpful. But it, it continues to be certainly uh, an issue, less now than before, but still an issue. Well, thank you again. Um, our final question, um, as an audiologist, do you have advice on talking to a friend or a loved one who you believe should have their hearing tested, but you don't want to, uh, you want to approach the situation delicately? Yeah. So this would be a lot easier if um, this were more consistent with primary um, healthcare physicians recommending hearing testing just routinely, like if it felt routine. So I think one way to do it would be to do it with the person and say, you know, I'm, I think I'm going to get a baseline hearing test. I hear you should do that. And I've never done it. Will you come with me? Like, let's do this together. So we definitely have people have success with that. Like, let's just both get it. And I think part of it is leaning into People worry that if they come to one of our clinics or any clinic, if they get a hearing test, they're going to be forced to get hearing aids. You know, that's the beauty of being an adult. Nobody can force you to do anything. So, you know, come get a hearing test. That does not mean you have to do anything about it. You'll have that information. And I think you want to kind of go in with that attitude, just getting a test or getting information, and then we'll see what we want to do. Um. We have several questions and I know we have one minute to, to go and I wanna to keep to the one o'clock end time. Uh, we have several questions about uh, tinnitus and yeah. uh, addressing tinnitus from an audiological perspective. Um, any final parting comments on, on tinnitus? Yeah, tinnitus is your, your nerves aren't busy processing sound and they're just randomly firing and then you're perceiving this. It's really annoying for some people, it's debilitating. So if you have hearing loss, the best first thing to do is wear hearing aids because it's going to bring sound in all the time and help those nerves be busy doing something else. Doesn't cure tinnitus, helps you notice it less. Um, there's a great, you guys have recordings of all the talks, right, Carrie? So there's a great talk by Lori Zatelli on tinnitus. Um, and we have a number of uh, clinicians who specialize that in our clinic. So we can help you, but watch the talk first because it's a terrific talk. I will use that opportunity to plug uh, our recorded webinars on the Eye and Ear Foundation website. Uh, we have several relative to tinnitus and they have all been extremely informative and helpful for patients, you know, seeking advice on how to manage manage their, their, 
their tinnitus. Um, it's one o'clock on the dot. I want to keep to that time. I know we have a few extra questions that we'll answer offline. I want to thank you, Dr. Palmer, for spending the hour with us, for letting us know about this really interesting topic. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined us. Um, we hope you have a good rest of your Tuesday, all of you, and, and thank you.